course, a special thanks to the members of the Italian and German parliament who have accepted to participate in this uh, webinar. And a special thank to the Embassy of Germany in Rome and to Ambassador Elbling. The idea of this uh, conversation is an idea of the German Embassy and I'm very grateful to the Ambassador for his personal presence. He will conclude our proceedings at the end of the seminar. Uh, EI has organized in the recent past a series of conversations between members of the Italian and of the German parliaments. We are, we are used to this format. We did so in the recent months uh, with the collaboration of the Munich Security Conference and we're very happy to repeat this experiment which has been very successful. Today, uh, the subject of this conversation is how Germany and Italy, who have been very good partners in Europe for years, how they could contribute to strengthen the role of Europe, both internally and externally, in this very special juncture. And uh, so the, the idea is to stimulate uh, ideas and policy recommendations on what actually could Italy and Germany do, for instance, in uh, helping the EU to better equip uh, their member states in the process of facing in a more effective manner pandemics like the COVID in the near future. How the, the EU could uh, actually ensure that the recovery and reconstruction phase, the post-COVID phase, uh, could be guided by a shared vision inspired by the need to move towards a more green and more digital economy, but also how Europe could or should regain a role of protagonist in the, in the international scene. Now, uh, briefly, uh, we know all that Europe has reacted this time in a very rapid and brilliant manner to the several challenges of COVID, much better than in the uh, economic and financial crisis of 10 years ago. Uh, the number of measures that have been rapidly adopted in the worst phase of the pandemic in the spring and later the next generation EU are there to prove how effective Europe has been in uh, responding to the pandemic. Uh, but now we are facing a crisis. We have to be realistic. We know that uh, because of the decision of two member states to block the approval of the MFF, we are in a stalemate. So how could we uh, both together cooperate to overcome this uh, stalemate, which is a serious risk, uh, not only for the next generation EU, but the functioning of the EU as such, since the budget is, uh, is stuck, is, is uh, blocked. And uh, finally, uh, if we look, not finally, but later, maybe there is another challenge, is the fact that um, within the implementation of the next generation EU, both Germany and Italy, probably more in Italy than Germany, are now engaged in the process of defining their respective national plans for reconstruction and recovery. So how would the members of the parliament uh, assess this process in their respective countries? How much do they think that the credibility of the whole exercise, and I would e even add the credibility of the EU, is linked to the success of these national recovery plans. And third subject, which is also of great interest, is how Europe should and could be able to recover the role of protagonists in the world scene. Uh, we are in the context of a deep crisis of multilateralism, which has been increased by COVID, but we're also in the presence of some important developments. For instance, the elections in the US, which are open new chances for a renewed cooperation and collaboration between the two sides of the Atlantic. There is a difficult uh, relation to define with China and there is probably the need to recover a better role in dealing with the crises that are affecting our neighborhood, both at the East and in the South. So, and finally, one word, if ever the famous conference on the future of Europe will be launched, how could Italy 
and Germany together co cooperate and collaborate for the success of this conference. So a number of subjects that I now leave to the uh, protagonist of this seminar and I leave the floor to Natalie who will chair and moderate the seminar. Thank you all, thank you again. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ferdinando, and also on my behalf, a very warm uh, thank you to the Embassy of Germany here in Italy for this uh, initiative and proposing to us to uh, co-host it together with the Embassy. I think that this has been an extremely important year for Italian-German relations. I mean, uh, it will come as no surprise to anyone uh, listening in that um, this has been a bilateral relationship that over the course of the last decade has seen many ups and downs. Uh, and I think that 2020 has really been a year in which uh, there could have been a really significant crisis. Uh, and in fact, it turned out to be the year uh, largely because of uh, many of the uh, issues that Ferdinando himself was, was mentioning. Uh, in which I think we can notice a very significant uptick in, in the relationship. Uh, and, and I think this highlights the fact that uh, this is a bilateral relationship, which obviously does not unfold in a vacuum, uh, but it is very much uh, embedded within the context in which Italy and Germany uh, navigate, both the European context and of course, uh, the international one. Uh, and hence uh, the significant steps forward which uh, are being made uh, in the context of the European response to the pandemic uh, on the one hand, as well as the way in which both Italy and Germany understand each, each other and themselves uh, within the broader international and multilateral system uh, in a context in which there is a real, on the one hand, of course, risk to multilateralism, uh, but also opportunity uh, to relaunch multilateralism uh, alongside uh, the upcoming uh, administration in the United States. So obviously, as I said, this is a relationship that uh, unfolds within a context, and it's a context that has been uh, fast changing in uh, and over the last year. Uh, so I'm delighted to uh, moderate now this panel with uh, a number of uh, old friends uh, with whom indeed we have had uh, the opportunity for several exchanges over the course of uh, the last months, particularly in a more sort of uh, private and informal uh, nature, and I'm delighted to be able to do so uh, in, a, in a public uh, way. Um, so let me just briefly uh, introduce uh, who they are uh, from uh, the German Parliament, uh, Neil Schmidt and Marianne Wendt, uh, and from the Italian Parliament, uh, Paolo Formentini and Marta Grande. It's a real uh, pleasure to have you today. Uh, let me also say before I jump into questions um, that uh, the way in which we will be organizing this is having a first moment in which we have an exchange amongst ourselves, uh, but then I would really like in the second uh, half of this meeting to take the opportunity uh, to really invite uh, all of you to chip in your, your questions. You can either do so uh, through the chat function uh, or do so by uh, raising your virtual hand uh, in what I'm sure you have now become all very accustomed to doing uh, through these uh, online platforms. Um, so let me uh, begin by, by perhaps Leah turning immediately uh, to you and really sort of Hearing your, your reactions, I mean, you know, both to the issues that uh, Ferdinando was, was mentioning, uh, i.e. the question of how Italy and, and Germany particularly can uh, work full stop and work with one another uh, in order to make next generation uh, EU a success when we actually finally do get to it, uh, hopefully sooner rather than, uh, than later. Uh, but also perhaps if you could uh, zoom in uh, also on the sort of foreign policy dimension of this, uh, and particularly when it comes to uh, our surrounding regions, um, both I would say to the east, if we think Ukraine, Belarus, um, as well as if we think about the south, and here I'm particularly thinking about uh, Libya, uh, how is it that this bilateral relationship could actually deepen uh, moving forward, uh, thinking of it, of course, primarily, I would say, in a European context? Leah. 
Well, thank you very much, Natalie, and thank you very much to Yai and the German Embassy for the invitation. Um, uh, it's, it is always very uh, interesting to discuss things from a, an Italian and German perspective. Uh, first of all, because as the Recovery Fund um, uh, saga tells us, uh, if we join forces, uh, great things can happen. And that's the starting point to your first question, how we can work together. First of all, we have to recognize to what extent and to what distance we can go when we work together. Um, especially with reference to the recovery fund, I think from our perspective, it is very important to explain once more and to stick once more to the idea that Next Generation EU is a package. Um, it includes things that are very useful to Italy, but it includes moreover an idea of where Europe should tend to. What is the direction we expect of the future of Europe? What is the ch shape we want to give to the future of Europe? That's why it is important to work not only on the things that concern us, but on the entire package. And I'm referring especially uh, to, discuss, to the ongoing discussion on the rule of law. Italy, as you know, um, is uh, very well into the course traced by the German presidency of the semester, suggesting that on the rule of law, we should not bend because this is not um, a package where you cater what is of interest to you, but is a, a complete package. And this is, the, again, the future that I imagine for, for, for uh, the working together of Italy and Germany and moreover of the entire uh, European Union. Secondly, looking at uh, foreign policy. There is a big development uh, on the table, which is uh, the Biden presidency. In this respect, I believe that especially Italy and Germany that for different reasons uh, have relied on the US initiative in various times since the end of the Second World War with various degrees of satisfaction of our public opinion and of our general political sphere, the two of us especially have to realize that we have to grow up. That the Biden presidency helps us a lot in many of the areas of crisis. And I'm thinking about the Eastern flank and the Southern flank, but it doesn't resolve the fundamental questions that lay at the heart of the future of European foreign policy. And the two fundamental questions concern, first of all, uh, what we want to do with the military instrument, to what extent are we ready to use this instrument in our neighborhood, to what extent are we ready to strengthen this instrument, and to think about strategic autonomy of the EU. And the second question is, to what extent are we ready to support democracy in different corners of the world? Uh, this role of support of democracy is something that historically, since the, second, um, the, the end of the Second World War, was given to the US. But now it's not only a matter of the US. Europe is surrounded by countries that struggle with the issue of democracy, by people that ask to be heard with democratic instruments. And at the same time, uh, we are surrounded by regimes who tend uh, to suppress any request for democracy. What do we do with this? How do we support uh, nascent movements, be it in Belarus, be it in Turkey, be it in, in North Africa? How do we favor transitions 
in those countries, and I'm not only thinking about Belarus, I'm not only thinking about Turkey, but I'm thinking, for example, about Algeria, for example, about um, Libya in a different respect. We have to answer to this question. We've come a long way since 1989 to realize that democracy doesn't only flourish in those countries, that you have to nurture democracy, that you have to nurture uh, the, a culture of rights, a culture of rule of law. We know it outside of the European Union, but we're proving it inside of the European Union. And these are big questions on our table. And I think that two countries like Germany and Italy, who in their past, in our past, we struggled with the issue of democracy. We learned what, how difficult it is to maintain a democratic environment, how fragile uh, nascent democracies can be, we can give a lot of thought in this respect, as well as a lot of thought on the use of force uh, on the international stage. I know that uh, thinking about these issues with Germans, you always touch a lot of um, difficult feelings and that uh, in Germany, there is a lot of caution in this respect. But I think these things should be put on the table, considering our common history, and we should start uh, untying some knots because now the situation is much easier with the Biden presidencies, but lots of issues are on the table in the transatlantic relationship. They concern these two points, and we cannot think, we cannot imagine that those issues will be untangled by a democratic president only because there is a democratic president in the United States. We have to come forward with proposals. I think that a, a, an honest dialogue between Germany and Italy on these points will help a lot. We know that France in this, in this two respect is much more ready to go forward on its own so it is very important that we start discussing these issues and that we bring forward some ideas on the table of Europe and in the transatlantic relationship. Thank you, Leah. I think you, you put, put there some, some really powerful points, um, which, which of course are connected to, to one another. Um, I'd like to turn to, to Maya now and uh, and ask you if you could perhaps, you know, or say whatever you want to say, um, but, but also uh, come back to, I think, two of these fundamental points that Leah put, put on the table. I mean, the first is this, this question of, of, of democracy and rights and, and rule of law. So in a sense, there is both an internal uh, European dimension to this as well as an international uh, dimension. Um, you know, how do we uh, ensure that we live up to our standards internally, uh, and hence the whole rule of law conundrum uh, within the European Union, uh, but also how do we go about uh, ensuring that we can continue promoting uh, these norms externally uh, in a world in which, let's face it, I mean, illiberal powers are, are affirming themselves, um, and there is a in a sense, and I think there will be a, a growing debate uh, within the international system uh, as to you know, what is the system of, of government that can better deliver to citizens. You know? I mean, as liberal democracies, we have been used to sort of um, you know, singing, singing the tune of political freedoms and economic prosperity can only go hand in hand. Uh, and of course, we continue to believe that. But, but the truth of the matter is that we have, for instance, China out there uh, that demonstrates that there is a different story uh, to be told. So I think, you know, the argument for us to make is, um, in a sense, becoming harder. Uh, and this has effects both within the Union, uh, uh, and hence the cases of, uh, of Hungary and Poland and others uh, uh, along the line, um, as well as internationally. Uh, so, Madden, let me turn to, to you now. Yes, uh, thank all of you. Thanks IAI, IAI and the German Embassy in Rome for organizing this event. Greetings to my colleagues in Rome from the Parliament and all of your 
friends from the German Italian uh, political community, I would say. I'm sorry not to see you personally just on this webinar since yeah, more than eight months, nine months, but that's the way it is. Um, firstly, coming back to questions, how can we stabilize the process of liberalization, democracy and the rule of law in the European Union? And we see now that uh, due to these questions, we have a block in the EU budget with Poland and Hungary. Um, this question, for my opinion, will not solve by just putting pressure on, on that countries. Um, we can say Hungary, they are, uh, don't follow the rule of law, they, they punish uh, the, the, the freedom of the uh, of press, the freedom of opinion and so on. But the people in Hungary and in Poland, and this is the first questions we have to ask, why there is a government which is uh, governing like this? Yeah, There are people who are voting for these parties. I think Fidesz has a two third majority in Hungary. So this is not a minority party. Uh, in Hungary, it's, it's a very real big party. It's not a extremist party or something like that. It's real, it's for, from the Hungarian perspective, it's part of the people. It's the people's party in the end. And this is what I can, I can understand a little bit more the meaning on opinions uh, from, from the Eastern Europe because I'm, I was born and raised up in the East Germany. So we have socially and politically both the same history. And we have a lot of people who are not following the rule of laws, parties, or the older parties in Germany. And they are following uh, populist parties who say, we are the people, not they are the people. Um, and this is like the same game we see on European level. In Hungary and Poland, these majority parties say, in Brussels, that's the old parties. These are the bad parties. We are the good parties for you. And so at first, we have to look to the people what is their questions. Um, uh, what, what do they have on the floor? And uh, when there is a big question of trust, uh, we, have to, we, have to, we have to accept that people distrust all the older structures, the old political West European structures. They had the question of identity. They ask, what is our part on that European Union? For them and for Eastern Germany, we just where we step by a system which already works. It's not what we develop a common European new system. It's just Western Europe exists, it's the European Union, and the others just had to step by. No one asked, what are your ideas of Europe? What are your ideas of liberal? How do you want to live in European Union? Yeah, as Germans, we East Germans, we also just step by a working political system in the West. It's okay, that was wonderful, everyone wanted. But no one had asked the East and Germans and the Eastern Europeans, how do you want to live? What are your experience? What, what maybe also worked right in your, in your older system? Yeah, and people are afraid now that, and it's a question of, um, of how you can accept their life, how you accept your life experiences, that they are not where asked. So that's the internal question we have to ask. I think the Eastern, Euro Eastern Germans and the Eastern uh, Hungarians are not less less uh, less for democracy than western germans and then we come to a second question um it's a question of of the systems um and how we can bring um the rule of law democracy and so on to the world and uh, as also neil schmidt which is from the social democrats a colleague for foreign policy and we have seen also in other countries just with military services and military engagement we will not bring a western western uh, western democracy uh, to other countries, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, all these uh, Arab Spring countries. For my opinion, and this is also with a German experience, democracy comes also with economic stability. The, the question why the German, Western Germany democracy worked very well, it comes together with a, with a, with a very good economy which come with the Marshall Plan, which brought an economical growth in, the, in Western Germany, which, were ex, which was extraordinary. And that brought a deep trust in the democracy and the deep trust also uh, in freedom of speech, freedom of opinion. And the people accepted that these values and this kind of political system is getting us the best. It will give us the best um, also economical perspective and the best economical system. 
And true, and that's why we have this, this answer I gave comes to an end if we look to China. There is no democracy. There is mm, nothing of values which we share. So in, in that question, we are opponents. Today, uh, Joshua Wang uh, was sent to prison for 13 months, but they have one of the best growing economies in the world. But for my opinion, it will, at that point when these economical growth will come to an end and will stop and the system will not fool with, with the mid-class society will not get, uh, get a better chance and will get a better life step by step. So if we process with increased process of economical growth will stop at one point, maybe also with the political system will collapse uh, with what we see in Turkey and other countries. But in our neighbor countries, firstly, I think we have to work with a good economical cooperation and we have to combine this economical cooperation with concrete expectations we have regarding uh, freedom of rights, freedom of speech, liberal values against corruption and all these steps we make. This is, this is what we have to do. And then uh, we are not, uh, European, in my opinion, last point is not in that position now at that point to give other countries, um, how we call it, actually, um, uh, good ideas or to, sh or to say how, how we can do it, I would say. And firstly, we have to stabilize ourselves in the European Union. We have seen that our European Union is not at that point reunified and we would have seen it as if we believe, if we see, look back in March of this year, no one thought about the European Union. And as the Corona pandemic started, everyone just, uh, every government just fought on national levels. Everyone closed his borders. Everyone took his own mask, which he can get. No one had the European perspective and there was no, in the first days, no European solidarity. And we noticed that we got a, short political shock when we opened the borders for mass goods and delivery because we have seen that all our that all our economy economies will collapse if we if we stop uh, um, if we stop the the economical exchange and uh, but that was a very interesting point for me where the people firstly see okay no one thought about Europe first just national and then in the next step they say oh we make a bit, we made a big mistake and now we are coming back to a more European discussion, uh, also in the German Italian way. No one is thinking about closing borders. No one is thinking about uh, stopping the economy. The national thinking is there, but is less. Um, yeah, we have this debate with the with the she. She is uh, going on she for vacation. There was a little, we call it a little fight battle between Austria, Italy, and, and Germany and the South Germany, but it was not so good. Um, but in the end. This has seen us, we have to cooperate more together and we should take all the, 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 um, um, all the, the resumes, which we see now in the Corona pandemic crisis, we have to take it and have to cooperate very deeper. This is the result of the last, first, last months for me. And this is where we have to go on. And then we can go as a stronger Europe, we can get advices to other countries, we can pressure other countries' migration, economical question, rule of law, and also in the government, in the cooperation with the United States government, because there will, the all times before Trump will not come back, we have to get our own position. Therefore, we should be thankful for Mr. Trump, uh, honestly, a little bit with a little bit, uh, not ironic with a little bit, um, I speak honestly, we could, sometimes we could be thankful for Trump because he has shown us a mirror, what, what should we do? Well, thank you so much for that, Marian. I mean, I think uh, you, you, indeed, you, you highlight this, this question, which I, I agree with very much, you know, I mean, you know, in, in order to promote values, one needs to make sure that one's own house is in order. I mean, because ultimately, uh, this is what, in a sense, soft power is all about. It is all about the power of example. And if that example starts kind of, you know, um, wavering inside, it becomes all the more difficult uh, to continue exerting that power of attraction, in a sense, from outside as well, uh, which connects to this question which you raised in your uh, first set of remarks, which is really a kind of about, about democracy and about uh, engaging the people, you know, engaging citizens and, uh, you know, rather than simply 
offering uh, in a sense a sort of model and a way but making sure that they're very much part of uh, of the conversation and this kind of allows me to make the transition to to Marta um, and really Marta sort of ask you again alongside anything else that you will want to say anyway um, if you could also reflect on this question which of course connects to the whole issue that Ferdinando was also raising at the outset on the uh, conference on the future of Europe uh, uh, of how is it that I mean I think you know this is that we I think we're facing an important as Europeans we're facing an important opportunity uh, and the opportunity lies in the fact that indeed there has been um, this step change uh, in the integration process, which provides an opportunity for citizens to uh, re-enamor themselves with the European project. Uh, but of course, in order to do so, it's not just, in a sense, uh, output legitimacy that has to be uh, there, but the input legitimacy and therefore the engagement of citizens in, in the European project. So if you could also share some reflections uh, as to how best to to, to organize this process in order to really make the most of it. Marta. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all again here in this virtual space that we we'll learned to, to use over the, the, the last few months. Um, well, I want to start from um, a thought that I had while uh, listening to all of you. And uh, that's basically the idea that also the European Union has shown as uh, maybe I'm thinking just now, the, the, the most important uh, place where actually, uh, where all the rules were respected, everything somehow worked. In the sense that if we look at China and how they handled uh, this pandemic crisis, we see that all the lack of information has generated, uh, I mean, something that, in the end went worldwide and at the same time also the United States was not able to address this pandemic um, in a way that was, uh, I mean, that, that, that gave good results, at least from the numbers that we are seeing. Whereas the European Union somehow it has learned to share information, uh, to share ideas. Uh, in Italy we have looked a lot at the um, uh, German uh, uh, health system uh, and we compared our two systems to uh, try to understand where were uh, our, our um, deficiencies and where we uh, were doing good. So from one side, I'm seeing that we uh, maybe have not reacted as a whole European Union, just one single continent that works together. Uh, but uh, seeing it from a political point of view, I also can understand that we took different uh, measures and different uh, precautions to fight against this COVID. Uh, but at the same time, I'm um, actually really appreciated the fact that over the months we have been able to share information, to share ideas, to connect with one another. I think that it was a great effort put into this uh, in this uh, 2020 by all European member states. So going back to the idea of democracy, I guess that that links a lot to what I was saying in the sense that um, I think that we have shown to European citizens uh, what are the rules and expectations that we have to meet. Um, things that we usually don't see as uh, very important uh, or that we don't consider as being fundamental are indeed fundamental and we see when we have a problem like as I was saying uh, transparency when you have uh, sharing information what it means to have um, a digitalized country uh, connections uh, within uh, within a whole continent all that mattered and that is what the European Union has been working on over the years that's something that we never really uh, thought about in the sense that when I talk with uh, people uh, that, you know, and I ask them what they think about the European Union, what it is the role of the European Union, uh, the values that we bring on, um, they, they tend to consider all the good aspects that we, that we achieved. Uh, but in the end, I think that this crisis somehow had also shown um, how the values that we had in mind 
when the European Union was created and everything that lies behind the bilateral relation between countries, um, it is important. Um, at the same time, going back to your questions, uh, I think that we have to reaffirm and to show all these values, all, all this work that we have been doing, um, again, to people. Because at the same time, we have a, a counter information, we have uh, crazy ideas that are going everywhere in the internet and that we have to address. It seems that um, at some point, uh, people detach completely from, from politics, from institutions, and that's what um, matters the most to me. I mean, somehow um, showing people uh, why and how politics uh, works um, that is obviously linked to uh, the idea of democracy, the idea of respect of the institutions, the idea of working together and cooperating. If we don't have a clear idea of what politics can do and why politics does um, specific um, uh, laws and, and why it works in a, in a direction, then we will never be able to appreciate anything, nor democracy, nor the values behind it, nor the cooperation within the European member states, um, anything, not even the, maybe the, the, the work that now the European Union is trying to do to, to save all us together. And um, if we look also at the um, integration process of um, uh, the Balkan states, for instance, uh, that's something that we absolutely have to keep in mind uh, if they were very much committed uh, up until some years ago uh, now this sense of uh, detachment from politics is starting to to grow and that is really one of those aspects that uh, the european union and all the member states uh, politicians have to uh, consider it's not something that we just you know put in a, in, a, in a corner saying, uh, okay, that will pass. People at some point will understand. We really have to work on that from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. And uh, let, me, let me turn to, to Niels now and, um, and perhaps ask him also for, for his thought on, on another, another question, which actually um, Leah had uh, raised at the outset. Um, which is this question of, of European autonomy, uh, European autonomy and how, how we should be thinking about this, particularly in light of uh, the new administration in the United States. Uh, now, your defense minister has been in a sort of uh, a recent spat uh, with uh, the French president over, over this question. And in particular, the sort of, you know, sort of, big issue uh, as to whether working on, on European autonomy, particularly if we think about it also, I mean, not exclusively, but also uh, in the context of uh, security and defense, whether this is something that actually reinforces the transatlantic relationship or should be seen uh, and in fact acts uh, to the detriment uh, of it. Um, and I think it's, I mean, obviously the question of European autonomy has been bubbling away for, for some time. Uh, but it is clear and perhaps inevitable that it has raised again, you know, um, in, in, in public debate and political debate, precisely as we await uh, the Biden administration uh, to, uh, to step into the White House. Uh, so, Niels, let me, let me turn, turn to you. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, I'm much on the same page as Leah. Uh, on the question of uh, strengthening uh, Europe's um, capabilities. Um, and as far as um, Ms. Kram Karrenbauer's um, conflict with President Macron is concerned, I'm rather on the side of President Macron, as long as he does not talk about strategic autonomy, but European sovereignty. I very much prefer the term European sovereignty to the term uh, strategic autonomy. Um, because strategic autonomy uh, reaches back to the debates of the 80s and 90s, which was sometimes 
construed as a decoupling of European security from the US. And uh, I'm deeply convinced that we need the security cooperation with the US within the framework of NATO in the future, because a strategic nuclear weapons, which um, uh, safeguard uh, Europe against any menaces from uh, third actors, malign actors, are not disposable on a European level only. So strategic autonomy will just not work. European sovereignty is a much better concept because it is derived from a very old um, term of political philosophy, which has a long tradition in Europe, sovereignty. And sovereignty is a much larger concept than just the idea of defending Europe, of um, having arms uh, or maybe even nuclear weapons at our disposal in, in Europe. Sovereignty in my eyes, and according to uh, the, the whole philosophical tradition we, we have in, in Europe at our hand, is means the capability to act externally and internally. So a state is sovereign as far as it is capable and has the appropriate means to act on its own citizenry and it, on its own territory. And as long as it's capable of acting in international relations in interaction with other states as well. So there's an internal and external aspect to uh, sovereignty. And um, I very much appreciated Macron's Sorbonne speech about European sovereignty because it broadened the debate. This speech and the concept of European sovereignty correspondingly does not only entail aspects of military security, but it also includes aspects of commercial, financial, and technology sovereignty, digital sovereignty. And it also does not mean that we have to give up ever more national sovereignty in favor of European competences. It's just the idea of reinforcing national sovereignty by adding layers and instruments of European sovereignty on top of it. And there are so many challenges facing us, European states, and the European Union as a whole, ranging from climate change to illegal immigration, that we need this kind of European sovereignty. And so Kram Kahnbauer was very much stuck in the 80s when she just restarted cherishing the old transatlantic friendship, which of course is also very dear to my heart and I love America and I, I'm very hopeful that the Biden administration will, uh, much, will be a, a much better partner than the Trump administration. But still, we in Europe, we have to defend our interests and our values with our own means, sometimes even against the opposite interests of um, the US, which is nothing new to us. Just think of the state subsidies uh, for uh, Airbus and Boeing. And we also have to enhance our level of, uh, uh, of, act, uh, of, of, of power uh, when it comes to financial sovereignty in order to um, overcome the domination of the dollar in, on the international financial markets by strengthening the euro. And we have to develop our own high-tech companies when it comes to 5G networks and artificial intelligence. So European sovereignty is much broader, much more open, and much more uh, per pertaining to what uh, the, 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 the challenges are we as European Union face uh, today. And so I hope that the French side will talk less about strategic autonomy and that all Europeans, Germans and Italians included, are ready to talk more about how to develop European sovereignty 
and uh, which aspects of it must be addressed as soon as possible. And uh, the um, European Recovery Fund, for me, is not only about European solidarity after the pandemic and about uh, reconstructing Europe, it's also a means of strengthening the international role of the Euro because thanks to the recovery fund, there will be an issuance of Euro bonds uh, and, uh, unpre and in an unprecedented scale, which makes the Euro much more interesting and attractive for uh, international investors. And I believe that this can only be the first step and that we must promote the euro's role on the international financial markets um, on an even larger scale because we need deep integrated European financial markets in order to use our financial and commercial leverage on the international scene as well. So that's my, my point, uh, that's the main point I would like to make. And I would love to see more Europeans taking part into uh, on uh, in this debate on the concept of European sovereignty. Thank you, thank you, Niels, and I I, I, I share your views. I, I'm I'm actually quite keen on the word autonomy, um, but but I think we mean the same thing. I mean, you know, the point really here is is, is having the ability uh, and the will, because at times we do have the ability, but we don't have the will uh, to act. Uh, and of course, our preference will be that of acting with others. I think this is simply part of what the European DNA is, which brings us back to this issue of, of multilateralism. Uh, but we also have to have the ability and will to act alone when others don't want to act with us. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so whether we're looking at it from the economic, the digital, uh, or, or indeed uh, the, the defense domains, I think this is basically what, uh, what, what the challenge at hand is. Um, but, but on this European sovereignty question, um, let, let me turn to, to Paolo now uh, and, and, also, and, sort of, and ask him to reflect on, on his views on, on where you stand, Paolo, in, in, in this debate. Um, but, but also if you could, because you know, there is, and here I, I want to start bringing in some of the comments, the numerous comments that are, have started coming in uh, to the chat function, um, and, and bring in a question that uh, Tiziana Boari uh, raised, which is really the NATO question, which we haven't touched on um, uh, sort of very, very specifically on up until now. Um, so in particular, as we look forward to a Biden administration, uh, and there is also a big question as to whether the time has come to rethink NATO's strategic concept. So preparatory work has been done, but uh, uh, the, the, the heavy lifting still has to be done. I think there is a sort of fundamental question uh, that, that we as Italians and, and Germans and, and Europeans and transatlantically have to address. You know, what, what, what should NATO's mission be? Are we still talking about... Um, a, a sort of focus on territorial defense in Europe? Uh, are we in the sort of 2000s in which uh, we were in the sort of out of area operation world? Uh, or should we be thinking China? So, so what is NATO's future in all this? Paolo. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, the future of NATO, of course, uh, being short is China. China and China again, because we have to think that uh, NATO was born uh, to defend uh, the transatlantic bond, transatlantic relation, the Western values. But today, in today's world, nowadays world, to defend those values, we have to tackle the issue of China. Today, uh, it has been said, Joshua Wong was sentenced 13 months in prison. And so Agnes Cho, 10 months, and Eva Lam, seven months. We have to be clear about that. Germany and Italy have to be clear, the governments and all Europe. We have to choose. We can choose China or we can choose USA and Europe. Of course, we stay with USA, but also with Europe. But it's important to, to come back to the roots because uh, we have to acknowledge the importance of the rule of law, 
or the, the democratic values without assessing the problem we won't solve the problem the problem is out there the problem of china uh, today um, according to someone may regard only hong kong youth but today we have to remember that taiwan is out there too and it's a big problem because we have seen that the who doesn't recognize taiwan doesn't accept taiwan but that that's worst uh, doesn't recognize the the leading example in the world to the world of taiwan in dealing with coronavirus so that's a problem of values according to me europe can be a stronger if it recognizes that the values come first a trade is important we cannot deny that but we have always to remember the importance of values and of national security european security but we think as league that uh, we do not need a, an european army uh, also because it seems to be in macron's mind something more regarding a uh, french grandeur that uh, european interests but uh, so we won't need to double uh, military budget of the european states we have the nato we have to defend the nato mm -hmm. and we will continue defending nato also uh, under biden presidency biden as trump has one point clear china is a threat to democracies to the western world thank you thank you paolo for that uh, very powerful statement uh, of, of really sort of asserting that um the values need to be put up up and center uh, but, but also about the question of china which indeed and i would agree with you i mean this is not simply a question of uh disputes that have to do with with trade or digital or, or what have you i mean you know it is clear that it is um, configuring itself as a political stroke ideological mm, confrontation in a sense which which really does pit liberal democracies um, facing and obviously having to learn to coexist but also confronting uh, authoritarian states of which uh, China obviously is uh, is up there. Um, moving through some of the comments that I'm, I'm seeing here, I wanted to turn back to, to Lia. Uh, Alfredo Rizzo, um, in relation to this discussion about rule of law and, and human rights, uh, also raises the question of, of um, uh, asylum and, and refugee policy. Uh, and I think this, again, you know, speaks to this uh, broader debate of uh, if we want to stand up for rights externally, uh, we also need to sort of do our, our homework internally. Uh, and of course, this has been one of the major sticking points uh, within the European Union and the sort of inability to really forge a common uh, migration and an asylum policy. So, Leah, perhaps if you could uh, sort of spare a few words on, on this question. Well, this is one of the matters where certainly uh, the collaboration of Germany and Italy can drive forward uh, Europe, both internally and externally, because we all know that uh, um, managing migration is not only an internal matter, but is, first of all, an external uh, question. Um, Germany has tried hard in its presidency to come to um, a solution to the, to the Dublin process, but it hasn't managed so far to broker a deal that is um, uh, equally satisfying all the parts um, but i would i would suggest two things one there is on the table not only the issue of migrants coming from the south but some migrants coming also from the east uh, especially the belarusian situation suggests 
that there might be an influx of refugees coming from the east as well hitting those countries and i think especially about poland that have been more reluctant to accept uh, any change to migration policy within the european union and i think in this respect especially a country like italy not i'm not thinking about germany could um welcome some refugees coming from Belarus as a sign of goodwill uh, cooperation uh, on the issue of migration with those countries that have not cooperated as much with Italy when we needed it the most. Secondly, I think that the German idea of a plan for Africa uh, that was brought forward at bilateral level. Some German officials have discussed it uh, uh, with me also, but in Italy extensively in the past years, um, is an idea that should be brought forward. The issue of, of Africa, of course, is strategic not only with reference to migration, but also with reference to many other issues. And the first one that comes to my mind is confrontation with China. Uh, there is a European plan for investment in Africa, which is the so-called Juncker plan. Uh, but the fate and the um, results of that plan are mixed. I mean, the, 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 uh, the evaluation on the fate and on the results of that plan uh, is mixed. And I think we should re-evaluate the plan. Uh, we should re-discuss it uh, and bring forward an idea um, of taking care of what happens south of the Sahara, uh, not only because all that happens there affects directly us, not only because there is a big geopolitical confrontation that will happen there, but also because it's written uh, in the Schuman Declaration, which says, which says that the fate of Europe is very much connected to the development of Africa. So in the founding document, in one of the founding documents of the European Union, it is written that either we take care of the development of Africa or um, uh, the European project will not have any sense. So there is a lot to be done, not only internally, and there are some avenues which we can explore, but also externally, uh, especially with reference to Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, and now the, the Africa question, of course, is also related to the situation in North Africa and in particular to Libya. And I wanted to turn back to Niels to pick up on a question that, again, uh, Tiziana raised, but, but also I would connect it to uh, a question that Fabio Bazzagni uh, inserted into to the chat, which is really um, a a boots on the ground question. Now, Germany has been extremely uh, active on, uh, on, on, on Libya, particularly on the diplomatic front. And I think uh, one has to give uh, credit to, to Germany for really having been proacting, uh, proactive in this respect. But of course, it's, uh, it comes as no surprise to uh, any of us that who is really calling the shots uh, in Libya are those powers um, that have put boots on the ground. So we're talking about uh, Turkey, we're talking about uh, Russia, we're talking about, or have supported boots on the ground. Now we're talking about the UAE, about Egypt, et cetera. Now, I don't wish to su sort of suggest here that as Europeans, we should put boots on the ground in the same way. Uh, but it is clear that if our presence remains limited to a presence at sea uh, and not to a presence on land, and by what I mean by on land is, is as I said, uh, more, uh, you know, not, not in the way in which others have been present, but more in terms of uh, being present to consolidate uh, a ceasefire, which of course has both civilian and military components to it, uh, then inevitably the game will continue to be uh, directed by, by others, particularly now uh, with the political dialogue uh, process that has restarted. Uh, so, so Niels, I mean, let, let me turn to you really on, on this question to ask you what, what you think as Europeans we should be doing, because of course this also connects to the de broader and more conceptual debate that we've been having about uh, European sovereignty. 
Yes, of course, uh, the military dimension must be part and parcel of European sovereignty. Um, by uh, strengthening uh, the European pillar of NATO. And there's a lot of work to do. We have to um, invest in our armies. Uh, the German government has increased military spending tremendously. Today, Germany spends more on the military than France. Uh, still, we are far uh, off the 2% goal, uh, but it's more about the real capacities and that's so, not so much about uh, the numbers, I guess, um, because in times of pandemic, uh, of course, the um, ratio will go up automatically without one single cent spent more on defense uh, by any European government. Still, um, there's a European role uh, in that game as well. Um, so, Territorial defense uh, is a European uh, task uh, within NATO. And of course, Germans love uh, building tanks. So uh, we're going to invest on that uh, as well. Um, uh, but there's also a EU dimension to that. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, um, in the case of Libya, that it will certainly not be very clever just to send troops there to have boots on the ground. But as soon as there's a real ceasefire, there is uh, the question of um, uh, sending a sort of um, a peacekeeping force uh, uh, to Libya, or at least to certain areas of Libya. That is under discussion. Um, and uh, this might be a contribution from the European Union to stabilize the country. But um, Libya should also tell us uh, or uh, uh, teach us a lesson about military interventions. Um, you know, just sending some fighter planes does not do the whole of the work uh, which is to be done in stabilizing a country. And that's why um, Germany was so skeptical about uh, the military intervention in, in, in Libya. Um, we need a much broader effort, uh, which might entail a, a military component, but still the political framework must be um, created uh, before you can really uh, solve problems in a proper way. So yes, um, there might be a role for the European Union, and I would even say that in the medium term, a European army corps could be part of European sovereignty, which does not mean that all the national armies should be dissolved and replaced by a unified European army, but there could be a sort of uh, 28th um, army um, alongside national armies and this would be would rather be not a territorial defense unit but rather a intervention unit co composed of european soldiers funded by the european budget controlled by the european parliament this would be an interesting step uh, forward for the military uh, side of uh, of european sovereignty Thank you. Thank you, Niels, for that. Um, let me turn uh, to, to Paolo for a China question that we uh, I, I also see on the chat, uh, also from, from Fabio Bazzagni. Um, now, Paolo, you, you kind of uh, focus very much on the political uh, set of problems when it comes to China. Of course, there is also the economic side of, uh, of this equation. And in particular, if I can paraphrase uh, Fabio here, um, you know, how do we deal with, well, I would say two things, actually. I mean, on the one hand, China's unfair economic practices. I mean, you know, we keep on saying we have to uh, level the playing field, um, but we would like to level the playing field, uh, meaning we would like China to liberalize. 
China's not liberalizing. Does that mean that leveling the playing field means that we have to level the playing field down rather than up, which obviously brings us to, to, the, to the topic of, of protectionism? Uh, so that's one set of issues. Uh, and also in, in, in Fabio's question here, there is this um, growing appreciation, particularly if we think about uh, Belt and Road, that this is not simply an economic project. I mean, you know, this is a project that has a strategic edge. Uh, and therefore, should we be looking at this in a sense only through the lens of trade and investment, or should we not also be looking at this uh, as, as a political and strategic project, which requires a political and strategic response as Europeans? Yeah, mm, thank you indeed also for this question. But uh, it's all about multilateralism because uh, it, the rise of China has been possible uh, thanks to multilateralism. We cannot deny this uh, simple assessment. Uh, we see WIHO, Tedros Ghebreyesus coming from Ethiopia, uh, and uh, mm, let's say uh, putting China first. And uh, but we see also food and agriculture organization led by a Chinese uh, China that in Africa is uh, the, the responsible of land grabbing. We cannot forget that. So uh, the WITO, uh, the entrance of China and the idea, the initial idea to uh, bring to China our values to bring more democracy, a uh, free market. But decades later, we can say that the, uh, utilizing uh, multilateral institution, China has grown and uh, the world is less safer, less free. And the repression in China on Uyghurs, Tibetans, Hong Kong is rising. So we have to rethink all of that. And again, to rethink, we have to start from values, from the rule of law, democracy, and we cannot accept compromises. We cannot accept compromises, trade, investment is okay until you reach the, the point, national security. That's our point of view. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paola, for that. Um, uh, Marian, let me let me throw to you uh, um, another question in in the chat function. I know that you've been in an exchange with Jem uh, over rule of law questions, so I'm going to leave that one to aside. But still sticking to Jem, uh, he also um, raises a question uh, which is connected to much of the conversation that we've been having, uh, in the, and in particular, it relates to, to defence spending. Uh, now we know that there is the uh, the famous two percent uh, target. We know that obviously Germany is well below, and Italy for that matter, uh, well below uh, two percent. So perhaps if you could um, sort of uh, give us your your thoughts of where you stand uh, in, in in this debate, uh, beyond in a sense the sort of formal commitments that we've made back in Wales, uh, how is it that we should be um, thinking about and addressing the, the, the question of defense spending. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't like this 2% debate because it just focused on, on spending and duration. It's a question of money. I mean, important is in the end, the boots on the grounds. So what is the outcome of the spending in the budget? As Neil Schmidt told, we have increased our military budget. We spend now more than in France, but important for foreign policy is how do you use your military? How 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 many uh, missions do you do you have that's important it's not a question how much spent for military it's important where are your soldiers on the ground how much mission missions do you make how much influence you have and how do you fight for our liberal values and for our european interests in the world that's in the end in, in, in necessary and it's not important if you spend 1.2 percent of your gdp two percent four percent whatever uh, that is that is just a finance question. Important for me is Germany has learned and is, in, and is on the way to learn, but it has to take more responsibility for 
uh, the foreign and security policy. We came from an era where, uh, where during the Cold War, in the West, we had the United States, in the East, we had the Soviet Union, and we were a little bit between, we are protected by the group of the European Union, and we were never in the position to, to lead a process of a foreign or security policy. Yeah, we never identify our own interests. What are the interests of Germany with outside of, 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 of Germany? I remember the debate, which I think federal, former federal president Kurler pushed, as it said, also economical interests were, defi were defended in Afghanistan. It was a fact, it was just a real fact, because if we save trading routes to, to the Middle and Far East, let's say stabilize our economy in Germany, that's a fact. But no one wanted to listen to that. And there was so a harsh debate on that, that in the end he resigned, yeah. And uh, today I think we are much wider, we are open for this. People have accepted that we have to take missions, what we have to send, for example, troops in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, by uh, by uh, federal police, by, by by border guards or by military services to protect the border, to, to support our countries, to stabilize them. This is where we have more and more acceptance. But I also know that military services, uh, military missions are not um, are not very very uh, how would say popular in Germany. But where is a country? Can you count me a country which is every time open and very open for, for military missions. I think military missions is a, is a necessity if you do foreign policy um, and you have to take a route, but there's never never a very, everyone is not happy if you have to take military missions. It's a necessity if you want to follow your goals, if you want to reach your goals, yeah? I mean, everyone would be happy without a military mission, but that's not the world it is. So this is what Germany has to learn. We have to crystal clear identify our positions what do we want? And then also we have to make pressure by using our military forces. We are increasing them. Also an example, for example, uh, for example, also our federal police, the Bundespolizei, they are more and more on, on, on missions outside Germany. We have now built new coastal guard ships, which are, which have this, they have the same size as the fregat has, you know, these military ships. Now we have three of them for the federal police, for our coastal guard. Yeah, for operating missions in Germany or in the Mediterranean Sea, for example, they are also equipped with a with a gun, with a weapon, so we can defend ourselves and we can have also make uh, make special missions with special forces together. And that's very important that we're becoming more and more um, a strong partner in regarding of the foreign policy and security policy. And then we can, and then we should talk, what can we do? Where are we engaged? Germany is very engaged. If you look to Mali, Djibouti, uh, Somalia, no, Somalia, Djibouti, um, Syria, um, we are in Afghanistan. We have lots of military uh, advisors in different countries. So Germany is very open. We're sending lots of troops worldwide. And this is what we have to say. And we're working on it. And together as Europeans, maybe with an European army in future, we can we can use this instrument very effectively uh, to to bring our values and to bring our our foreign and uh, security policy in the world. Thank you, Marianne, for that. I I must say I I'm completely with you uh, in in terms of um, framing this not simply as a debate about how much is spent but how much is done. Uh, and and this is why I always think it's very useful to not only talk about European responsibility taking, but also European risk taking. Because of course, when you do things, it means, and this is the reason why missions and operations are not very popular, it does entail running risks. And the reason is, that, I mean, the reason why we uh, haven't done it so far is that so far someone else has done it for us. Uh, and this brings us, of course, back to, to the transatlantic debate. Uh, I wanted to try and, and chip in another couple of questions before I turn to the uh, ambassador. Um, and so I'd ask, uh, I'd ask you all to be, to be very brief. Uh, Leah, perhaps if I can uh, turn to you Alberto Schiavoni's question, uh, which is really a question about uh, vaccine development of, on, on which obviously Italy and Germany uh, uh, have both uh, been working uh, very much. And in particular, how this connects to uh, also the Commission's proposal for the development of a health union. You know, is, is this something uh, on which 
we should uh, rethink competences uh, moving, moving forward at European level? Well, I think that um, we don't stress enough in our public debates the extent to which the European Commission is helping us um, on uh, the medical side of the pandemics. Uh, the fact that uh, the Commission is buying vaccines for all of us and is avoiding competition between member states and is setting the price and is doing all the procurement is very uh, important and we, we don't uh, stress it enough. So certainly we should, we should do that. Uh, certainly uh, the fact that uh, we have a pandemic is one of the reasons that uh, uh, more tangibly helps us explain to our citizens why we need a stronger union, why we need a closer union. So yes, on certain matters, we should have more coordination at the EU level. And I think what the Commission is doing already is a lot. And we should um, underline this much more than we do currently. Thank you, Leah. Uh, Niels, a debt question for you from uh, Jan Hein. Um, now, uh, sort of the, the, the debt, debt debate in Europe has been kind of, you know, for the time being, being put to one side. Uh, but at some point, it will obviously have to uh, have to be readdressed, huh? and this obviously concerns particularly countries like uh, like my own Italy. Um, but but also, as we know, this has been very much part of uh, of an Italian, German, and broader European debate. You know, how is it that we should be thinking and rethinking about uh, debt, debt mutualization, et cetera, et cetera? There's been lots of talk about this. Uh, in the in the last uh, few weeks, um, so perhaps your your more than two cents worth on on this, Niels. I'm quite confident that we have overcome this uh, old debate uh, over debt by creating um, the uh, recovery fund and by issuing uh, Corona bonds. Um, which showed to all of us that we entered a new phase and that European solidarity um, uh, was there or is, is there, is there. And so um, for me, this is a, as Olaf Scholz put it, a, a Hamiltonian moment for the European Union. Um, once you issue a huge amount of debt, you have to address two issues. One is how to pay for this debt. How will the European Union repay the debt it incurred? And the second question is how will this, uh, these funds be distributed um, among uh, the different levels of uh, European governance? Um, and these two questions always point to a, a sort of set of rules we have to establish um, to, to manage this debt. And this is precisely what happened uh, in the US at the start of the, uh, of the Federation. And although European Union will not evolve into a sort of uh, United States of Europe, um, any common debt uh, will have consequences on the functioning of the level of government that issues uh, this debt. And so I believe that uh, once we have, uh, uh, have uh, drawn on the positive uh, experience of the recovery fund and the connected bonds issuance, we will be. We will have a more open debate uh, uh, among Europeans, but how to use this instrument in the future for other crises or at other uh, occasions. And um, I think this was a good start. And we should drop the old debate about euro bonds and about uh, debt uh, sharing. Um, maybe we should just uh, find new ways of uh, addressing the issue. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Niels. Uh, Paolo, a quick question uh, for you. And this is a, again from uh, Fredorizzo. Uh, it's a question concerning, again, the United States, but in particular, the United States in the Mediterranean. And whether we should be really expecting a massive change with a change of administration in terms of US policy in uh, our region, uh, or whether the relative disengagement that we've seen from the United, of the United States from the Mediterranean, we should expect to continue. Uh, and therefore, again, entailing, I guess, this is not in the question, but I say it, entailing that we sh as Europeans should shoulder uh, a greater share of that responsibility and risk uh, when it comes to this region. Yeah, I start from your final comment. I think that uh, we Europeans should uh, think more about the Mediterranean and that more in the Mediterranean. Uh, the southern flank of NATO is not uh, only the southern flank of NATO, but it's the southern flank of Europe and it's uh, Italy uh, national interest to uh, be in the Mediterranean, to be in Libya, but it's not only Italian interest. We see what's happening with migration, we see what, what's happening with terrorism, uh, and we need to be united on that. I think USA will be there, not much will change, not much, and we can cooperate uh, with the United States but to defend our values. Uh, we have a big problem, speaking of NATO, that's uh, assertive Turkey, uh, from Cyprus to Nagorno-Karabakh uh, to Libya, we see again what's happening. So uh, we can work together, we can uh, defend values, but we need to be there. That's the point. Thank you, Paolo. And this uh, allows me to throw a last question to, to Mariam. Uh, and again, here I paraphrase a question from Nato Espinosa. Um, there is, is, again, really a question about values. You know, sort of one thing is how is it that we protect our values and what standards we should hold ourselves internally, uh, but, but especially then when we turn outside, you know, can we really expect uh, others to live up to those same values. And if we do accept a lowering of, of those values, what is the effect that it has on us as a European project, really? Yeah, firstly, we have to keep in mind, we just not put our values on other people who don't want. Um, we know it from the, and Mr. Ambassador also know, we know it from the German-Italian relationship. The Italians often see the Germans, ach, the people from the north who want to explain us how to live and how to do something and how to organize. This is not seen very good in Italy, I know it personally. So we have every time, if we talk about Africa, if we talk about Afri other states, which are in our opinion, maybe instable, which need support, where we have to explain something and how to organize political processes, fight against corruption, et cetera, et cetera. We have to give them the feeling that we are balanced on the same level and we, that we are not, uh, in, 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 in a position where the Europeans come and explain how to organize the world and how explain the people how they should live. We should see what do we people want? How can we support them? Important for us is that there is no danger and uh, for uh, outside for that country, for other countries or for the European Union, that's in our own interest. But then we have to accept that we cannot make a Westminster democracy all over the world. That will not happen. I'm honestly, but it's, that is realistic as so much I wanted and I pray for it for also uh, for other things. We pray for example, in every day when every Sunday we pray for the peace on earth, but we know peace on earth will maybe never happen. But it's, a, it's, it's an aim you have to follow that you have a line and that you work for and that motivates you. But this is what we have to say. We have, we have to take the countries as we are we have to take the politicians we have, and when we can support these countries, pushing them a little bit, but not saying we come, we, we move in with troops or whatever, and then explain them how to do without exa getting accepted by the people locally. And this is what we have seen in other countries. If we just enter giving a lot of money or sending soldiers, 
and this is not accepted by the people, then it will be have no uh, long distance. Um, uh, how we call? It? We will not win win a long distance. Yeah, we will ha have no long distance results or effects, and that's the problem. This is what we have to learn. This is what we have to accept, and then we, if we accept this, in my opinion, we can be very successful uh, on our goals, on our aims. But at the end, sometimes Libya is Libya, and will not becoming a democracy like Italy or Germany is. It's it is, yeah. And maybe it was a better lift for most of the Libyans and most other people as we had Gaddafi, as we don't want to accept it, but it was a stable and secured country and most of the people in Libya liked it. I don't like this idea, but we have to accept it from one point. Our, our former uh, leader of the caucus, Volker Kauder, always said, politics start by, by looking to what is realistic. And if we see what is realistic, then we can start with politics. The other things are nice to know, but will not come to an end. Absolutely. And uh, and at times also there are others that can teach us some things. I mean, you know, you're sort of mentioning Africa and, for instance, as far as pandemic response is concerned, maybe there are a couple of things that uh, we could also learn from others. But, I, you know, and I completely agree with you, this is not a story about wagging fingers, um, but, but really looking, as you say, as uh, reality for, for, for what it is. Uh, I think this has been a really wonderful uh, discussion. Uh, I've uh, in, enjoyed uh, sort of conducting it, moderating it immensely. Uh, so let me now turn uh, to Ambassador Ebbing for some final words. Ambassador. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you um, to you and uh, to, to Ferdinando Nelly Feroci for organizing this. I think I, this has been a great uh, debate um, with so many points, issues, and thoughts that it's difficult somehow to, 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 to try and, and bring the things together. But I, I would say, let's say, um, a, few, a, few, um, a few thoughts from my side, starting from maybe your view, Natalie, that we are living in a, in a time of, of change, um, of, of transformation, but also of opportunities. And probably one thing we have not talked too much about um, today has been, uh, let's say, the, the, the global um, uh, part uh, of, of the problems we're, we're living. We've talked about, a little bit about health, um, not so much about, about climate change, for example, but there are some issues that overarch, let's say, everything we've been um, talking um, um, about. And maybe one interesting thing that come um, out um, of, of that, and there I connect a little bit with what uh, Marta Grande was saying, um, the role of policy and of maybe going even a step further of, of the state. Probably we have a situation now where um, the citizen expects a little bit more from politics and from the state that maybe he did in the 90s. 90s, the time of the Washington consensus, the time of the expectation that uh, complete liberalization uh, of everything would, would be the best way to solve many problems. Maybe we are in a new phase now. now uh, and maybe the pandemic has somehow uh, shown this very clearly. The citizens are expecting action from well-organized institutions, well-organized states. And I think this is an, an, an important message um, uh, to all of us, to our, to our, to our societies. But turning to, to Germany and, um, and, and Italy, I would say that, like uh, Leo Quartapelle said, I think this is a, a really uh, not only unique, but also uh, I think underestimated uh, relationship in in Europe, and uh, we always look back to to you know the founding members of the EU and um, so the history of our relations, which is of course fine, very important. But I really think that um, we we have a few things in common that we can really bring with more strength into the European Union, at least, but probably even even uh, further. Um, one is our, um, our capacity and our tradition of striking compromises. You know, uh, we are um, countries that have to find, you know, solutions through, um, through compromise. And I think the European Union works like that a bit too. You know, we are always criticizing the fact that we are too slow. And, uh, you know, Marian Wendt was saying, you know, be careful when we try, you know, to to, to put on other people our, our ideas on how to do things. I, I couldn't agree more. In the end, our system in the European Union and so much in depth also in Germany and also in Italy, I'm convinced of that, 
is that to try to bring everybody on board. And in the end, even if we are slower in our consensus fighting, uh, finding, probably we have um, common ground that can be uh, really uh, much more substantial and much, much stronger than, um, than um, let's say, if we have to, to force anybody into, in, into something. And this goes for the migration issue, you know, this goes for the issue of, of the financing. So I, I don't think we have, we should look in Europe to the good or the bad, uh, bad guys, as we do very often, but I think we really should try and think a little bit with the heads of the other ones. I think the chancellor said a little bit, um, something similar to that at some point and try to understand and bring really also the citizenry into, into, our, into our decision making. I think this is, this is very important. For the rest, I, I would say that um, if we look not only into foreign policy, Germany and Italy are incredibly close in their position. If you look into migration, into the Berlin process uh, for, for Libya. So, I mean, we, we, we really are always playing in the same team and maybe we should spell this out a little bit more like Lia Quartapelle um, said. I think this is less said and less known that it should be actually. We should really invest in that and also make this a little better um, known. We really are very close to each other. Our governments work incredibly closely. I would like you know, our members of parliament to have even more exchanges because I think this is one layer that probably um, is today to say it in some way, um, probably some of the members of parliament will, will not agree 100%, but I would say it's probably less strong than it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And I think this is an important investment we should do. And all the people who are on the board uh, talking with us um, at this table today, uh, they are, of course, ex excellent examples of how you should do it because they really have this very close context. But I think institutionally, we should do even more for that. And let me just take the occasion to say that um, somebody like, uh, like uh, MP Marian Wendt, I mean, he has played an incredible role personally, I have to say, and get, thank you for that in the whole question of the, um, of the Italian patients who were brought during the pandemic crisis to, to Germany. This has been an absolutely innovative uh, effort that has never been there before and a real example of how we can do things together. So, I mean, this is really a, a relationship we should value uh, much more. On the, on the issue of EU sovereignty versus um, autonomy, yes, there is a discussion, of course, about uh, what term um, to use. Um, in the core, I think it's about saying, you know, we want to take more our own destiny, you know, in our own hands, we want to decide what our priorities are, what, um, how we should implement things. And this goes from health um, down to the, to the issue of, um, of security and of, of defense, of course, I would tend to, to agree with uh, Neil Schmidt on what he said. I mean, in the, in the end, if we look at the military, let's say, um, uh, we'll not say adventures, eh, but the military um, uh, expeditions that have been uh, undertaken in the past, uh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, um, in Iraq um, and Libya and so on, they are not many examples of things that have gone really well. I mean, the, the, the German reflex to say, okay, we are very, very careful on this is probably uh, one that I, I, I would share. At the same time, I would just uh, recall that still in the 90s, um, the, the, when the German government decided to have a one German soldier on board an AWACS airplane to control uh, what was happening on the Balkans in the Yugoslavian war, uh, um, a party that was at uh, government or in government at the time called on the German constitutional court to see whether that was constitutional or not. So we have evolved a lot from there. Things have changed a lot. And I would say still being, let's say, uh, more civilian probably than military in our in our thinking, we think that um, that more um, so development on the on the defense side um, is um, of course uh, needed. Very very clear. Um, as as Neil Schmidt said, I mean uh, this goes far beyond uh, you know defense and uh, this far um, 
uh, this goes um, far beyond the question of the military, strengthening the, the, the euro, the, the commercial questions. Um, this is uh, something that uh, also has to do um, with, uh, with, with strengthening um, our side of the Atlantic and um, uh, their return to NATO and the European pillar. I mean, there, there's very clear that uh, we have to have a development there. I don't think there is, in the end, a very big def difference uh, when we talk about, um, about the autonomy and the question of, of sovereignty. I think probably everybody agrees that we need a stronger, or nearly everybody agrees that we need a stronger European pillar in, um, in, in NATO. What is the, 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 let's say, the main objective of, of NATO? And Paolo Formentini was, was looking at China and, and, um, and, and what, uh, what challenge China brings to us. Um, I mean, um, probably we will continue to have a very uh, mixed um, view of, um, of our, what our relations with China um, should be. I mean, this will be also the case um, with the new Biden administration, but probably we will, we will um, see China, uh, go on seeing China as partners also, of course, com also commercial partners, uh, because it, it's the second uh, you know, economy of the world. So we'll, we'll have to interact um, with them, but also as competitors, you know, no question. And, and as was said before, systemic rivals. I think the three things play a role and we have to be able to, to actually live with the tension that comes from this different uh, uh, points of view without our forgetting, of course, our deep uh, values that we continue to, to, to cherish and to, uh, to defend. That's very clear. But I think we will have to live with these three aspects. I think this is, this is very important. Maybe uh, this is a different situation that NATO uh, was facing during, uh, during the, Cold, the Cold War. I mean, uh, the Soviet Union was not a, a major economic uh, force. Um, uh, it was a military force, it was a systemic rival, but it was not somebody we wanted to interact day by day. Um, there were, I mean, some issues, energy and, and others, where this was the case, but not in a general way as uh, we are doing it with, with China at the moment. So I think we will have to approach this um, in, a, in, a, in a novel way. I, I probably would say that China has not brought only bad things, for example, to Africa. If one thinks about the question of, uh, you know, quite cheap goods coming from China, um, uh, being made affordable for, for, for the African citizens or something um, have, has moved over there, but it's a systemic rival over there too. How will this develop in, develop in the future? Um, difficult to say, I don't know, there is this famous uh, quote ascribed uh, to, to Chu and Lai, who asked by, by, by Nixon during the ping pong diplomacy, you know, uh, and the, about the worth of democracy, you know, and Nixon was saying, well, but would you agree that the French Revolution was um, a good thing for the world? And then Chu and Lai seems to have answered, uh, it's too early to say. You know, and and, uh, and uh, maybe this was also a wrong uh, translation, some people say, but anyway, this is what's ascribed to him. So I think uh, no one knows where China will be. They have a lot of ground to, to cover coming from being a developing um, economy. So there are big uh, growth uh, um, rates there, but we don't know how, how these um, will end. I would like to say one last word on our, um, um, let's say, cooperation and the way we go forward in the European Union. We live in a time, I think, where integration um, has made a big step uh, with uh, um, the decisions we, we have taken in, in, um, in July and hopefully we'll be able to subscribe very soon in the, in the next days. And I think this phase um, also brings us to a new way of um, of living in this European Union in the sense that I think we need a, a new way of co-responsibility in all senses. This means, in my opinion, when we talk about solidarity, uh, solidarity should not be a one-way solidarity, which is what we hear quite, quite soon. I think we should understand um, solidarity as being co-responsibility for, 
for everybody um, in the European Union in all in all senses. And I, I am a little bit afraid. I have to I have to admit in this phase of you know moral hazard and free riding um, in a situation where uh, all our countries you know keep. Uh, keep the responsibility for their um, fiscal um, uh, policies, you know, um, and uh, with not a lot of European responsibility there. And this is really a danger one should keep in mind when we look at the incredible flows of resources and money we are to see in the next uh, future. So uh, this is one thing we, we have to watch uh, closely. I stop here and I've talked already too long, but I have a, you have said so many interesting things that I, I try to at least touch on them. Eh? So thank you very much to everybody from my side too and it was a real fantastic um, discussion.